Are you playing with small Proxmox clusters and want to get into high speed networking without paying big bucks for a high speed networking switch? Maybe you've got two or three nodes and you just want to put some 10 gig cards in each node and connect them with direct attached cables. Or maybe you've got some crazy setup with five nodes and quad gigabit NICs in each card. Or maybe you're the guy that's got two Intel NUCs wants to connect them directly to each other with Thunderbolt. Well, in this video, we're going to cover fully routed cluster networks which can handle any topology you throw at them and will find the most efficient path to send packets all throughout your cluster. So let's get started on this adventure. So we're going to start with a setup where we have three nodes and they're all connected to a plain gigabit network switch. We are going to call this network the public network and all of our nodes are going to con be connected to it. This is where things like the web UI runs, Chorusync is going to run on this, the Proxmox cluster service. If you have any interaction with the internet, it'll be over this link. Now we're going to start adding some high speed links that directly connect nodes to each other. Some of these in blue, make them a bit bigger so we know what's going on. So we could just put two in, we could put all three in. If we have all three, then we have enough redundancy for PVE ring one to send a packet to ring two or ring three if any one of these high speed links is down. And if somehow all of our high speed links are down, or a particular node doesn't have any high speed links, it can fall back on the public network to send its private traffic. So now for our fully routed network, we're going to give it a separate subnet than our public network. This is going to become our private subnet or our cluster network. For this example, I've chosen the subnet FD69 Beef Cafe 64. You are free to choose anything you want as long as it doesn't overlap with anything else in your setup. This is a completely unique subnet, even though it won't show up on any link. So given that we now have a private subnet, we can assign addresses to each of our nodes on the private network and let them communicate via these point-to-point -point links. So to manage these routing tables across the private network, we're going to use a protocol called OSPF, Open Shortest Path First, and that's implemented with a package called FRR, Free Range Routing. So I've got a Proxima cluster I've already set up. It's got three nodes. They're already clustered together. Let's hop on and see how it looks. So in our cluster, we've got our three nodes, PVE ring one, two, and three. Each of them have three network adapters. One of them is our gigabit, and that's our VMBR0. It's already existing, that's ENS18. And then we have two high-speed links, ENS19 and 20, and they're all the same. Now, they don't have to be the same in your setup. In my case, they were. But you just have to know what interface is which. So whatever interface you're leaving as is, leave connected to your VMBR0. And whatever interfaces you want to use for the routed network, we're going to go in here and say auto start, but we're not going to give them an address at all. We're just going to auto start them. So I'll check auto start, just make sure it's not changing anything else here. So it's just adding those two as INET manual, that's good. And then do that to all your nodes. So make sure your networking drivers are working, the interfaces come up, and they're enabled. So now our node here, we're going to look at the IP addresses we have just to make sure that the interfaces came up. So IP A. So in this case we have four interfaces. So first one is called LO, that's our loopback and then it has the usual colon colon one. We have ENS18, which has nothing on it because it's part of VMBR0. ENS19, which got a link local IPv6 address, which is great. ENS20, also got a link local IPv6, also great. And then VMBR0, that's where our real address goes and that's the bridge we use for VMs. It's the default when you set up Proxmox. So now that those links are up, we're gonna install FRR. So this is pretty easy. We just apt install FRR. And do that for all the nodes, of course. So once this is done, we need to tell FRR that we want to run the OSPF v3 daemon. So to do that, we have the file etsy, etsy FRR daemons. And here, go to OSPF 6D, yes. So, Technically, the protocol is called OSPF v3 for IPv6. FRR calls it OSPF6 for IPv6. So OSPF60, yes. And then save that file. Do that for every node, of course. Normally, we would restart FRR, so it starts the daemon. But in this case, we don't have any IPv6 config at all. So we need to edit the FRR config file. Let's see FRR, FRR.conf. And so currently, it just says log this syslog. That's it. So we need a little bit more than that. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to enable IPv6 forwarding. It's 
Simple as that. Next up, we're going to configure each of the interfaces in the system for how we want them to behave with OSPF. So first up, the loopback interface. So exclamation point and then new line interface LO. Tab in. So I mentioned we're going to assign each node an IP address on the private cluster network. We're actually going to assign it to the loopback adapter. As weird as that sounds, Linux will accept packets for any of the system's address if they arrive on any interface. If we were to set an IP address on all of the point-to-point -point links, and one of the point-to-point -point links were to go down, that address would no longer belong to the system because the, addre the address only exists when the interface is up. So by adding an address to the loopback interface, that address always exists in the system, and Linux will accept packets for it no matter what interface they come in on. So whether they come in on our ethernet or whether they come in on our point-to-point -point links, they'll always end up to that destination. And we can use that subnet of the cluster network to identify um, where our source address should be. So over here in the config file, IPv6 address, we're gonna put the address of this particular node on the private cluster network. And that's gonna be a 128. So this is a single address. So the subnet mask will be a single address. We have 32 or 128. Then we're gonna set it as part of the default OSPF area. IPv6 OSPF6 area. And we don't want OSPF to be advertising itself on this address. That would be kind of silly. So we're gonna say passive. Good. So next up, we're gonna configure our VMBR0. This is going to be our backup link. If all of our point-to-point -point links go down, we can still route across that network, even if it's slower. If some of your nodes don't even have point-to-point -point links, they can rely on this network as their only way of communicating with the cluster network. So, so again, exclamation point, interface VMBR0. And this time we don't need to give it an address because there's already an address on the interface. We just have to tell it how to configure OSPF. So again, it's part of the default area. It is a broadcast type network. This means there could be potentially many devices speaking OSPF v6 on this network. We would like to talk to all of them. Basically means that OSPF is gonna establish a designated router. So one of the nodes on the network will decide that it's gonna be the one that computes paths. And last up, the cost. So cost is a number that OSPF uses to calculate what the optimal route is. So if you have a tree of routes and each route has a certain cost to take a, to take a packet across that route, and you need to go across, say, three different links, you add up the cost of those three links to get the total cost of the route. So when OSPF is computing the ideal route from one point to another, it's going to take these costs into consideration. The standard way of doing this is to take some high bandwidth, say 100 gigabit, and divide it by how fast your links actually are. So a one gigabit link would have a cost of 100, 100 gig divided by one. 10 gig link would have a cost of 10. 25 gig link would have a cost of four, for example. Um, but you can manipulate these to drive traffic the way you want it to. So my recommendation is to start with the 110. If you, if you know the speeds of your network, you can put that in. Um, if you're using all gigabit, you should make sure your point-to-point -point links have a lower cost than the broadcast network. Otherwise, it'll just send all the traffic over the broadcast network. And now each of the point-to-point -point links. Now the point-to-point -point links don't need to have IP addresses explicitly assigned because we can just rely on the automatically generated IPv6 link local addresses. So in my case, ENS19. So this is a point-to-point -point network. Point-to-point -point networks don't um, designate routers. They just talk to each other as a pair. So that and the cost. And finally, some general configurations for the router. So we need to give our router an ID. So OS PF6. And this has to be unique across your system. In my case, I'm just gonna use the address of the node. 
So 551 is this particular node, 552, 583, etc. Then we need to tell OSPF what routes on the system it should push out. So not only is OSPF going to spread routes across the network, it's also going to find destinations on the network and advertise them to everyone. So in this case, we want to say we're going to advertise everything that's connected. And since the loopback adapter is always connected, it'll always show up as one. Done with that file. Now we restart FRR. So you can see if we do IPA again, so our address on the cluster network is now added to the loopback adapter. That is great. Now we do this to the other nodes. So for this node, the address needs to be different, of course. This one's going to be 552. And the router ID needs to be different. And if you have different interface names on each system, make sure you update that too. And of course, update the daemons file. So if we go here to the node, we do IP-6. Oh, it should show us the routing table. Oh, look at that. So FD69 Beef Cafe 1 is our own, so that's dev LO. And then 552 via the point-to-point -point link dev ENS19. And 553 also going via ENS19. So I'm not sure why it's not taking ENS20 there. I'll just take a little bit of converge. So you can see 551 is via our own interface. 552 is via the link local address on the point-to-point -point interface, dev ENS19. And 553 is via the link local address on the point-to-point -point interface, dev ENS20. And those both came from OSPF. So now if I ping one of the other nodes, now look at that. So now that we can ping across the link, let's see what happens with iperf. So I started iperf server on PV ring three. I'm gonna use a tool called nload. So we just give it all the addresses we wanna do. So we're gonna do vmbr0, ens19, ens20. And so I can just use the keyboard to switch between each of these, show you how much bandwidth is going on it. So from PVE2, we're gonna to connect to PVE3. So 553, and you can see we're doing a heck of a lot of gigabits. If I just run that for a long time, come back over here. So VMBR0, not much traffic. ENS19, not much traffic. That's connected to PVE1. And then ENS20, oh boy, look at all that traffic. So 14 gigabits going out, eight megabits coming back. That's TCP X probably. So what happens if I turn off this connection? So there's, these Proxmox nodes are actually running in this Proxmox node. So if we go here and we, oop, we unplug the cable. Oh no, look at that cable unplugged. But, switched right over to the other link. So that means all this traffic is now running through PVE ring one, even though it's not part of the conversation. So if you run nload over here, sure enough, BMBR zero is not doing anything. ENS19 has a bunch of data coming in, and ENS20 has a bunch of data going out. So because PVE2 and 3 lost their connection to each other, they're routing via PVE1. So let's say hypothetically PVE3 isn't connected to the other two by high-speed links at all. So we'll turn off both of our high-speed links. What happens if we do that same test? Looks like we're going across VMBR0 this time. So it's going to fall back on the public network if it can't communicate on the private network because it's allowed to use OSPF on the public network. So what if we want to build an even crazier setup? So here I have set up five nodes in a ring. So they're all connected to the public network as they were before. And now each of them is connected to the nodes on either side of it in a full circle. So there's a ring network here and it's fully routed. So any node can talk to any other node. So I pull it up here. So I pick, for example, PVE2. Say I want to trace a route to PVE5. So can I ping PVE5? Sure can. How about trace route? Two hops there, I'm going via one. So my, I am two and I'm talking to five. So two to five, traffic is relayed via one. Makes sense. So what happens if I take this link down? So 
Okay, a little different path this time. We're going three to four to five. So this link is down, so we're going to three to four to five. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. Now we're on iperf here. I'm running it on PVE one, and I'm going to connect from PVE. I don't know PVE three. Yeah, so it looks like we got pretty good throughput there. This is virtual, so no real 10 gig. And then what's going on with the load on PVE two? So looks like PVE2 is relaying our traffic. It makes sense. So hopefully this video helps you understand how to build fully routed cluster networks like this. They're really useful in cases where you have small clusters, you want to do high bandwidth links between specific point to points, but you have more than just two nodes, you can't just create a single point to point link, but less than enough to buy a high bandwidth switch. Or maybe you want to try something wild, or you have a bunch of networking hardware laying around, whatever it is, hopefully this can help you. So as for what traffic you can put on here, like SAF or migration or replication, I got a video coming up on that, so stay tuned. Uh, I got a Discord link down below if you want to chat or ask me any questions about this. Um, of course, I love IPv6, so this is all IPv6. It translates to IPv4, eh, not quite so cleanly, but if you use IPv6, it'll be all good to go. And uh, as always, I'll see you on the next adventure.